just wanted to make okay there we are good morning i'm here good morning okay great yeah i just wanted to make sure before i ran away with it so um very pleased today we have miss summers with us she is the program director of the master physician assistant department at samuel merritt university here in california she is originally from portland oregon she earned her Bachelor's of Science from Santa Clara University and a Master's of Science from Baylor College of Medicine, where she completed her physician assistant training in 2001. She completed a medical Spanish immersion program on the border of Mexico, working with underserved patients and spent the first six years of her career working among the underserved Latino communities in the general pediatrics and family and internal medicine. She moved to family and preventative medicine practice in Mill Valley in 2005 in California and has worked for the practice for over 15 years, currently as a telehealth provider. She began working at Samuel Merritt University as adjunct faculty in the fall of 2005, became a principal of the member of the PA faculty in 2008, uh, was the academic coordinator from 2008 to 2015, and became the assistant program director and then the program director in 2021. So that's quite a, a good journey you have there with Samuel Merritt. That's, that's very, that's great. Good morning. Thank you. Yes, I've been at Samuel Merritt for almost 18 years now. Um, so uh, between that and doing family medicine at the same practice for almost that much time, I've been really lucky to be um, to have a really stable and long career so far. And I have a cat on my lap this morning who might decide to pop her tail up and say hello. And my kids are downstairs watching a movie. So hopefully um, I can do this uninterrupted for a little bit. But that's the, the joy of being a PA is that you can do anything and it's super flexible. Um, I saw some Q&A questions that didn't get answered and I'm happy to address those if we have some time as well. Um, but I, uh, I think I'm gonna start with just a little presentation about Samuel Merritt so that you can learn a little bit more about our program specifically. Um, and then I'm happy to answer questions about our program or our admissions process or just being a PA in general, um, since I have been doing this for a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And since I'm a teacher, I've been teaching online for the last three years and I'm very familiar with this um, with this situation. Um, so Samuel Merritt University is in Oakland, California. We have campuses in other places. We have a Peninsula campus in San Mateo, a Sacramento campus, and a Fresno campus. Right now, all of those campuses are just solely nursing programs, um, but we expect to be expanding um, out into some of the satellite campuses in maybe five-ish years or so. Um, but right now, our campus is for PAs is in Oakland. Um, CASPA opens, I'm sure you all know this, but on April 27th, um, and we'll be starting to review applications for the PA class of 2026. Um, we have a pretty small principal faculty. Um, it looks like a long list, but really there's only about four of us that are full-time faculty. Um, myself, Julia Stevens, uh, Alex Duplancher and Lorraine Petty are the, the four people that are full time. The rest of our faculty are about 50 percent time um, because everybody continues to work clinically, um, which sometimes is a little tricky with things like events and meetings and things like that. But it really brings a lot of richness into the classroom because they have a lot of experience and can say, you know, yesterday I saw this patient in the emergency department or in occupational medicine or in geriatrics. And we have a wide range of um, clinical experiences amongst our faculty. We have myself and Julia work in family medicine. Alex um, has worked in infectious diseases um, as well as internal medicine. She started a TB clinic in Solano County um, and has done a lot of public health work. Um, Tomas, our medical director, is a pediatrician. Lori and Lorraine work in emergency medicine. And Karen does occupational medicine at Stanford. Megan does geriatric home visits and hospice care. Um, Carly's done orthopedics and emergency medicine. Joy's a pharmacist and a PA, so she works uh, worked at clinical. She just retired last year, but she's spent 30 years working at the VA, and Martina's doing um, clinical um, pharmacology. And then Cecily is um, one of those unicorn PAs who went to the Davis program 100 years ago and got an FNP and a PA degree. Um, and so she has been working in both the, the FNP program and the PA program at Samuel Merritt. So lots of different experiences. Um, Cecily has a lot of experience in transgender medicine and has worked in gender affirming care for the last 15 years, setting up clinics around the Bay Area. So 
Um, it's a really wonderful faculty who brings a lot of different experience to the table, um, both as PAs and as educators. Um, and I think that really brings a lot of depth into um, the experience for our students. The university itself started um, over 100 years ago as a hospital school of nursing. Um, it was established by Samuel Merritt, who was a physician and uh, activist in Oakland. He was a mayor and um, did a lot of activities in uh, in the Oakland community and started the School of Nursing. Um, it was uh, not a degree program until 1981 when the first degree program was established, which was the Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, um, and then continued to grow exponentially through the 90s, adding a bunch of other healthcare programs, including the PA program. Uh, many of those programs have gone on to become doctorate level programs. So we have undergraduate nursing, um, master's level programs and doctoral level programs that are all um, uh, healthcare programs. The PA program started in 1999 and graduated its first class in 2001. Um, so we have been around for a while as well. Um, we've also merged in the 90s with the, the California School of Podiatric Medicine, and that was our first doctoral program. And then subsequently, the OT and PT programs have both um, gone on to have doctoral, developed doctoral programs. And then, of course, the FNP program uh, now has a doctor of nursing practice program as well. So a long history at Samuel Merritt. Um, we've now grown into three separate colleges. So we have the College of Nursing, which has uh, multiple undergraduate and graduate programs, the College of Podiatric Medicine, which was formerly the California School of Podiatric Medicine, and the College of Health Sciences, which includes PA, PT, OT, and basic sciences. And I'll talk a little bit more at the end about some of our new programs that are coming online as well. We also have several centers for excellence at Samuel Merritt. We have a health science simulation center, um, which is growing um, as we kind of expand uh, the university physically. Um, we have about 10,000 square feet right now, and that's going to be growing to uh, close to 80,000 square feet over the next couple of years. Um, and in simulation, we have low fidelity simulation, which is things like task trainers um, and you know human models. Uh, and then we have high fidelity task trainers, which are um, mannequins that can breathe and crash and die, and you can do all sorts of interventions on them. And it's a great way to learn in a safe environment. Um, and we also do a lot of standardized patient training in simulation, and where we bring in actors who are, are really amazing to um, play patients for us. So our students get that experience with a real human, again, in a safe environment. We also have a human cadaver lab. We're one of the few programs left that still has human cadaver lab and doesn't use virtual anatomy or prosections for um, PA students. Our PA students do dissections and, uh, on their own cadavers. There's about four or five students per table. Um, and we really think that that's a, a really important experience. We've really fought hard to keep our human cadaver program um, because we feel like you know people who are going to be going into surgery as first assists, I um, really need to have a strong background in anatomy. And the best way to get that is by doing dissection. Um, we also have a health in it, uh, ethnic health institute and the ethnic health institute houses a lot of our community engagement and community service opportunities. So they're really instrumental in developing partnerships in the community in Oakland and around the Bay area. Um, most of our community service and volunteer experience has happened through the Ethnic Health Institute. Um, we just got a new partnership just yesterday. It was announced that they got a $1.5 million grant um, to partner with uh, some of the programs in the Bay Area around transgender medicine. And that will be a new experience for our students to be able to provide um, volunteer uh, patient care experiences in that community. So we're really excited about that. Um, we also have a Center for Academic and Instructional Innovation. This is really more faculty focused and helps us to um, learn and do a better job with education, you know, pedagogy and setting up courses and how to teach better. Um, this was really instrumental as we went through COVID and had essentially three days to transfer the entire curriculum online and, uh, and then back again over the last year. And so they've been really helpful um, to provide us with instructional design and academic support for the faculty so we can continue teaching and, um, and do a good job at it. Because um, most of us had never taught online before, and it's really different than teaching in, in person, as I'm sure all of you know, as you've you know transitioned doing your undergrad or prerequisite courses. Um, a little bit about our accreditation history. We got our first accreditation, um, provisional accreditation in 1999 when the program started and have gone on to be reaccredited several times. 
Um, we went through a difficult period in 2019 where we were reaccredited but put on probation status because of some issues with our assessment, particularly around clinical year assessment. Um, we made a lot of changes and had some help with consultants um, to really focus on improving our program and addressing the concerns that the ARC had. And we're really pleased and validated to um, get reaccredited in 2021, two years after being put on probation. Um, and we went from having 21 citations to zero. So we really felt like we had adequately addressed the concerns that the ARC had around our clinical assessment um, issues um, to a really satisfactory degree. And not only that, we got 10 years for our next accreditation site visit. So we were really excited about that outcome um, and felt like that really, that process was not fun, but it helped us to really improve the program. And, um, and we've really used that as a positive stepping stone to move us forward. So our next accreditation site visit is 2029, which is awesome because it's not very fun and it takes a lot of, of time and energy away from teaching and students. And, um, and so we don't want to do that very often. Um, our pants five your summary report. So when you're looking at PA programs and evaluating them, it's important to look at their, their accreditation history. And it's also important to look at their pants pass rates. And you want to always look at the first time pass rates. Uh, most programs have a 100% or near 100% overall pass rate because people usually pass on the second time. But looking at the first time pass rate is really important. Um, and looking at it over time will really give you a good sense of how the program is doing, um, how they're progressing, and how seriously they're taking um, their, their education responsibilities. Um, you can see that in 2018, we had a dip in our pants pass rate of 76%. We did a huge uh, deep dive study into what happened that year. Um, and if you think about the slide I just showed you about how we were, we went through accreditation in 2019 and got put on probation, that's not a coincidence, right? So in 2018, a lot of our energy was going to the idea of potentially expanding to a satellite campus. We were really focused on um, that expansion. We were not really focused on what was happening in the didactic or the clinical year. Um, we actually ended up having no didactic citations at all. All of our citations were on clinical assessment. Um, and then our students went on to not do very well on the pants that year. So it was a very clear indication to us that something wasn't working. Um, so again, we we did a lot of work over the next two years um, to really focus on our clinical year assessment. Um, we did not end up expanding into Fresno at that time. We wanted to really focus on Oakland. Uh, and you can see that our pants pass rates really rebounded strongly after that um, to 98% and then 93%. We had another little bit of a dip for the class of 21 down to 87%. That's probably mostly related to the pandemic and the response that those students um, had to suffer through with the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Uh, they really suffered in their clinical rotation availability um, and you know, just with the online education and the transitions and all the things that we all had to struggle through through those couple of years. Um, we did take a little bit of a hit on the pants pass rates that year. Um, we have rebounded. Our class of 22 has taken the pants with a 97% result. Um, and so we're pleased to see that um, things have gotten back to where they should be. Um, I'm not going to read all of this to you because you can read and you can look this up on our website if you want, but I just kind of wanted to touch on our curriculum. So we do, like most programs, we have a preclinical curriculum followed by a clinical curriculum um, where we start off with basic sciences. So we have four semesters of didactic training followed by three semesters of clinical training. Um, we start off with primarily basic science courses in the first semester. Um, then we follow to, with two semesters of integrated curriculum for medicine, physiology, and pharmacology. Um, and then our second fall semester is really our medicine specialty courses. So that's how the curriculum is kind of meant to progress from basic science to uh, medicine specialty courses primarily. Our clinical rotations include um, several core or required rotations and then two electives. So the required rotations are five weeks in length. They're family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, emergency medicine, and women's health. We also have a required geriatrics rotation that's a little bit shorter because it's not an ARC requirement. So it's a three to four week rotation. Um, depending on the student's needs, uh, and then a behavioral medicine rotation. Right now, because of the lack of availability of behavioral medicine um, rotations and providers in California, um, that rotation is shorter. It's a one to two week rotation. And then we supplement that with a PAXL a two week virtual rotation, um, as well as some other online modules. Our students get trained in substance abuse treatment 
um, with several online modules um, to help to supplement the rigor of that rotation as well. We have two uh, elective rotations. One is a traditional, you know, do an elective and a specialty of your choice kind of uh, kind of elective. Um, a lot of our students choose things like uh, cardiology or infectious diseases, plastic surgery, or other surgical specialties are common choices. Um, and then we have a second elective, which is a virtual elective. This was born out of the pandemic when we really needed um, an alternative to clinical placements when you know, doctors and PAs just weren't taking any students and hospitals were closed down to all but essential activities. Um, and the students loved it. And so we've actually kept it um, post pandemic because it's been so successful. Uh, and so with the virtual electives, students have some required virtual modules covering things like nutrition, um, dermatology. Um, I think we have an EKG boot camp in there. Um, and then they have the option to do either additional online modules or an optional short um, supervised clinical practice experience if they wanted to do a second elective in another specialty, like an urgent care elective or you know, some other um, medicine specialty elective uh, that they didn't do for their first traditional elective. And so that's been really nice because it allows for people um, to have that whole five weeks as, an, as a virtual option. So people have had a lot of people do things like get married in that rotation or take um, you know, take times to to do kind of family vacation type of travel stuff where they can do the virtual stuff on their own time. Um, and we've had other students that have chosen to do a two or three week second clinical rotation. So it's nice to have that flexibility. Um, I'm going to go back for a second because I didn't realize I didn't touch on this. So for end of rotation exams, we use the PA Education Association exams. Those are standardized um, exams that we use, except for geriatrics, because PAEA doesn't have a geriatrics exam because it's not an ARC requirement. Um, so we have our own in-house exam for that. And then we do have Roche review. We've, we've been using Hippo Ed this year as well, although it hasn't um, been super successful. The students don't love it. Um, so we've gone back to Roche review. Um, Roche review is fantastic. It's a great uh, test data bank so the students can get practice questions um, and it has nice explanations of the questions so students can do it either in tutor mode or testing mode. Um, and it's really been helpful to prepare them for uh, studying for their clinical rotations. And then after they graduate, they have access for three additional months while they study for the pants. Um, just a note about our COVID pandemic response. I keep hoping I'm going to not have to talk about this anymore someday, but I keep having to talk about it. Um, so just to kind of to be aware of, of our response to COVID, um, we started just doing distance learning in March of 2020, like everybody else on the planet. Um, we paused our clinical rotations for three months. So from March, uh, mid-March to July, we didn't have any clinical rotations at all. And then we restarted our clinical year with four-week rotations instead of five-week rotations. Um, and that was really due to the availability of rotations, which was not great. Um, and the fact that we wanted to try to graduate students on time as much as possible. We didn't want to cost them a bunch of extra money in tuition, um, you know, because of the pandemic response. So we were able to graduate them on time for both the 2020 and the 2021 cohorts. You saw that we did have a dip in our um, board pass rate, our pants pass rate um, that year uh, down to 87%, but it has rebounded since then. Um, and our grads have, we do have a 100% uh, second time pass rate for those years. So that's good news. Um, we began a slow reopening plan in fall of 2021 with essential activities only on campus. Um, and then that has progressed over time since fall of 21. Um, we did have a pause in January of 2022 because of the Omicron uh, variant. If you're if you were in California at that time, you remember that it was terrible and pretty much everybody got COVID at that time. Um, and so we closed campus back down for about six weeks, um, and then we reopened in February. We continued to use PPE and physical distancing restrictions actually until April. Um, April 3rd, we went back to no mask mandate, and that was the first time in three years that we had had no mask mandate. But we're back on campus now without physical distancing restrictions or mask mandate anymore, which is pretty exciting. Um the class of 22 returned to five-week rotations and graduated on time. Um, it has continued to be really difficult for the clinical coordinator to, um, you know, to have sufficient rotations. It's been a really a, a big struggle, not just for our program, for all programs, um, to maintain our clinical rotations. But we did manage for the class of 22 to go back to five-week rotations. Everyone graduated on time. Um, and they had a 97% pants pass rate. So that's been good news. And now we are back to normal. 
Um, so uh, as, as I just mentioned, as of April 3rd, we don't have mask mandates or distance restrictions anymore on campus. Um, and we're really back to you know business as usual, essentially. Um, We've taken some learning tools and tips out of the pandemic. We now have uh, hybrid courses where um, even though we're back on campus, we do have a Zoom cart in our classroom so that if students are unable to be in class um, or have remote learning accommodations, we still have a Zoom option. Um, that's been great because our lectures are all now recorded and students have those recordings. That was something we didn't have before the pandemic and that's been really helpful for learning. So there have been things that have come out of this experience that have helped us to grow and learn um, how to teach better. And so we'll just hold on, hold on to those silver linings um, as we move forward. Future directions at Samuel Merritt. Um, we became an independent nonprofit university in January of 2022. And so there have been lots of changes um, to, within the university community since becoming independent. We used to be owned by Sutter Health and now we no longer are. So we continue to maintain a, an affiliation with Sutter Health and clinical placements and things like that. But um, but now we can make our own decisions for financial growth, which has been really important for the growth of the university. Um, since that time, we have um, plan made plans for a downtown Oakland campus. They just had the groundbreaking on April 10th um, in our downtown campus. It's going to be a high-rise downtown green certified building. It's really cool, the stuff that they're doing. They're going to have a rooftop garden, and it's all sustainable, and um, it's it's a really cool building. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be a 10-story building downtown Broadway and 12th Street in Oakland. Um it's all going to be, you know, BART access, public transit access. It's it's really exciting. So we're hoping to move in there uh, January 25, and um, which would mean that anyone that's looking at coming to Samuel Merritt PA program and hasn't applied is going to apply this year or anytime later. Um, this will be your campus. So that's exciting. Um, we've also experienced a lot of of growth in our online and in our physical programs. There's been a lot of growth in some of our online nursing programs, particularly. Um, we just added a master's of social work program uh, in the College of Health Sciences, as well as an undergrad kinesiology program that's going to be starting this fall. Um, and then they added a certified nurse midwife program in the College of Nursing. Um, I expect more growth to continue as we move into the new building and then look for um, you know, future growth opportunities in Oakland. So it's an exciting time to be in healthcare and to be at Samuel Merritt as we grow and, um, and expand our programs. Um, if you have questions about prerequisite courses, application deadlines, or the admissions program in general process in general, uh, don't reach out to me. I am not the right person to ask those questions to. Um, please contact our Office of Admissions. Um, Tonette Green is our dedicated uh, PA admissions counselor. She's amazing. She gets a bajillion emails a day. So be patient with her response time, but she is super knowledgeable. She knows way more than I do about CASPA and the application process. She does all the pre-screening stuff before the applications get to our department. So if you have questions, don't ask me. I'm not going to know the answer and I'm going to tell you to contact Tonette. So go to Tonette specifically. She's lovely. Um, just a few tips about strengthening your application, and then I will pause for questions. Um, things that we commonly see and recommend for applicants who don't make the cut in the year we're looking at um, are things like improving your GPA. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. That we have wonderful, you know, junior and community colleges in our community um, that can help take classes that are interesting to you, and not just for prerequisites, but courses that'll help to boost your GPA up. Um, gain more direct patient care experience, get strong letters from those clinicians that you work with, make sure that you've worked with people directly and that they will write you a strong letter. If they're not going to write you a great letter, don't ask them. It's not worth it. Um, and it's really helpful to have letters from PAs and MDs, um, as well as FNPs. But in our program, at least, we're specifically looking for PA and MD supervisors or colleagues that can write you a letter about um, how you'll be as a PA. And then shadow a PA, which I realize is a totally hard thing to do. Um, but it's really, really helpful, especially if you can shadow PAs, not just that you work with, but outside of where you work and in different kinds of communities to see how PAs work in different areas. They're, you know, a PA working in family medicine is totally different, does totally different things than a PA in orthopedics than a PA in inpatient medicine. Um, and that's one of the wonderful things about being a PA. Um, but I think it's really helpful to see PAs in action in different communities and different fields to, to get a sense of what we're really doing and what we're really about. All right, so I am going to stop sharing and 
let's see if there are questions. Yeah, so we have a great deal of questions. I know a lot of these <laughs> were uh, from some of our previous speakers. So I'd like to open up to the attendees now. If you have anything you'd like to ask Mrs. Summer specifically, you can go ahead and drop those in now. And otherwise, we'll go through. And um, what, yeah, what, um, <laughs> how are you feeling most comfortable? Would you like me to uh, ask them to you? Or do you want to go through them? Sure, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we have an anonymous attendee. Although the PA CAD is not required, can I still submit the score? Yeah, definitely. We've actually just started looking at the PA CAT and Casper both. Um, we don't require either of those at this time, but we're looking at, at um, considering those in the future. Um, so yeah, if you have a PA CAT score or a Casper score or an MCAT score or a GRE score, we don't require any of those, um, but they can certainly be included in your application and it doesn't hurt anything to have them in there. I have the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have the next question from Natalie. Uh, she wants to know, does PA allow for any flexibility for family emergencies? I think it depends on what program you go to. In our program, we do. Um, all, most of us are parents, and um, I know as a working mom that um, life happens, and kids happen, and families happen, and um, we really pride ourselves on being a family-friendly program. And so we've worked with students um, when they've had family emergencies. We had a student a year ago who needed to go to Alabama for a month when um, she had a family emergency and, and she was able to attend classes by Zoom and take her tests remotely. And um, we were able to work with her on that. We've had several students that have had remote testing um, or even remote learning accommodations over the last couple of years that haven't been able to be in a classroom because of being immunocompromised. Um, and we've been able to accommodate them. So we do try to be really, um, really understanding. Once we matriculate students, they are in our family and we do everything we can to keep them there and, uh, and work with them to, and support them. Not every program is like that. So I, I can't speak to other programs, but that's how we address those issues. Yeah, that's, I think one thing that I've heard a lot is it, it's very difficult to be in this position of applying to schools and trying to get in. Um, but what I was told is you have to think of the schools are investing in you. And once it's 100%, uh, you know, you, you can trust that, you know, they will be in your corner because they think that you have, you know, your worthwhile investment. Yeah, absolutely. And from a higher than the PA program perspective, like from the senior administrative level, your seat is tuition money and they don't want attrition because that costs money. Right. We can't because of the nature of PA programs and how we move in a successive way. It's not like an undergrad program or next semester. We can just admit more people. Right. Once we have a class, that's our class. And so it's tuition dollars to the administration um, if there's attrition. So they don't want that either. <laughs> so even even more it help you out there. Uh, we had a few questions and these were pertaining to the kinds of patient care hours and whether they count for PCE. No, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is something that uh, attendees and students can find on the website for Samuel. It is. Yes. Yeah. We have a minimum of a thousand hours that we recommend. More is obviously better. Um, I personally, when I'm reviewing applications and on the faculty in our in my program, um, we like to see a breadth of activities. So it's really nice to see if someone has, I don't want to see like 200 hours here and there. That's not really helpful. But, you know, if you have 1500 hours as a CNA and another thousand hours as a medical assistant in a different setting, um, that's helpful. That shows us that you, um, you know, have experience in different areas. Um, we have lots of people that come in that have experience as CNAs or medical assistants, EMTs are probably, those are probably the most common um, things that we see, but that's, it's all listed out on our website and pretty extensively. Okay. Another question yeah. that Oh, sorry. Another question that came up is, in your experience, how do PAs typically fit in to the decision making process for patient care? Are the times, are there times where you wish you had more or less input? Um, I think it depends on where you work and it depends on your relationship with your supervising physician and the team of people. Um, I think generally physician PAs slide right in as part of the team. Um, some of it depends on personality and like how assertive you are and how much experience you have and how confident you are in yourself um, when you're contributing to the team and the discussion about patient care. Um, have I ever wished that I had more or less input? I don't think so. I work in family practice, so I'm fairly autonomous. Um, I'm you know, definitely able to reach out to my supervising doctor whenever I need to or anyone else on the team. We, I work with other PAs as well as nurse practitioners and doctors. Um, and I think 
I think if you have a good team and you have people that support you and that you trust and that trust you, um, you what you put in is what you get out of it. And uh, if you don't have a good team and you don't feel supported or trusted, go somewhere else. You're a PA, you have flexibility. Yeah, uh, another thing that I've heard quite a bit of, if I can chime in, is you know the the team healthcare model is you know what we're all trying to adopt, and that it, it's very important that it you know it's it's not just one provider taking care of a patient; it's it's a all hands on deck. So exactly, and then you get better patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few questions on extracurriculars, so volunteering as to whether you know you prefer medical field volunteering or community health volunteering, and then another question or two on what extracurriculars are most important to Samuel Merrick, given, you know, the, the statement of the university, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I think that what I usually tell applicants about volunteering is do something that you're genuinely passionate about, because that's really what comes across in your application and in your interview is if you're doing volunteer work because you think it looks good on a resume and you're not passionate about it, it's, that's not going to be a good experience for anyone, right? For you, for the people you're volunteering with, you're not going to get strong letters from those people because they're going to know this isn't your passion. Um, put your energy where your passion is. And we look for sustained community service and volunteer experience for something that matters to you, whether that's in education or spirituality or medicine or nature or whatever it is. Um, I love to see community service and volunteering. That is a huge part of our mission, right? Is community service and um, and just service. And so we love to see that, but I, 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 you can feel when it's genuine and when it's not. And uh, I definitely want to see that, that genuine thing that you care about and are passionate about. We had a question come in that asked, is Samuel Mary PA program still having rolling admission? We don't have rolling admissions, no. Let us see. I actually, I had my own kind of question or comment. I was really excited to hear about the new building. That's yes. That's, that's me too. I'm really excited. I um, every time I think like look at the plans or go to a meeting about stuff, I just get more. Like the they're doing such a beautiful job. Like they really want to get. I can't remember what it's called. The certification thing where you're like certified as a green building. The lead lead L E E D. Yes, LED. Yes, they really want to get this certified and have the rooftop garden and like community space and have the outside kind of area. And it's, it's like really, you know, after having been at Samuel Merritt for such a long time and just the crappy facility buildings, like we've gotten the leftover setter buildings forever and nothing's ever fixed and our ceilings leak when it rains. And it's like, I can't wait to be in a new green sustainable building. It's really exciting. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see it. That sounds amazing. Buildings uh, cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of money. Say, <laughs> that's why we have to have program growth. <laughs> yeah, that's really, that's because you had mentioned before with, you know, expanding the program into the satellite campuses and then having the struggle of, um, you know, that 2018, 2019 year. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's quite a triumph that the new building is on its way and that everything else is, is right where it needs to be. Yeah, it is. It's a good thing. Uh, we have a question. Since you're, oh, there's your cat. There's my cat. Are there any books or podcasts? I, I think any resources that are helpful, you know, to listen to as, as a pre-PA student to get their mind in the right place. I'm probably not the best person to ask about that just because I've been doing this for so long. I don't know. Um, there's a PA survival guide book that came out a couple years ago. That's really good. Um, I recommend that one. That's probably the only, I don't, sorry, ask some of the new people. They probably know better than I do. Yeah, ask the student panel because um, the students will probably have a better. The students input. will know. Yeah. Right, the yeah. students are all over that kind of stuff. Like you just read it. <laughs> you, you've been a PA since you were nine years old. So yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I've been a PH educator since I was 12. So it's been a long, you know, it's been a minute. We had a question come in. Um, are there barriers for equivalency or reciprocity between PA school of different states, job locations, or from PA job locations between states? Um, from PA schools, like transferring between PA schools? I'm not sure if that's what that's asking. No, like I don't, practicing I, from one state to another. From one state to another. Oh, um, the only barriers really are that you have to get licensed in each state individually. Um, so the national level is the, the board exam, right? The PANS certification is national, but everything else is statewide. So every state requires a state license. And the licensing processes is a little bit different in every state. 
Um, so I think the only barrier or obstacle I would say was just to, to be to contact the states and know what the different requirements are. Um, in California, you go to the PA board. Um, upon graduation, we send a form in that says you've officially completed the program, and then they process your PA6, which is the form that's required to get your license. And so they have to have your certifications, you know, pass score, and then a completion form from us. Um, when you transfer from another state, um, I moved from Texas to California, so I had a Texas license, and then I had to get a California license. Um, that process took a while. Um, and so especially if you want to get credentialed in like a hospital sitting, setting, which also takes two to three months, um, that can be hard. I think I was out of work for three or four months just waiting for like license and hospital credentialing and all that stuff to go through when I moved from Texas to California. Um, so that's that's kind of an obstacle. You have to sort of plan for like, what am I going to do in the meantime for working or making money? Having a spouse is helpful um, so they can help support you. Um, and then just understanding that the processes and the laws are a little bit different in each state. Um, but every state, you know, you can practice as a PA in every state, just that the, the regulations are a little bit different. Well, we were mentioning before about how important service is, um, especially, you know, given Samuel Merritt. Uh, now, I have, there's a question, how important is it to pursue leadership? Uh, before applying to a PA school? How does that look like to the university? In our application process, we have a holistic admissions process. So we look at, we do look at things like service and shadowing and healthcare experience and GPA, but we also look at kind of overall metrics of, um, you know, teamwork and communication. Um, our core values that we evaluate applications on are on our website. Um, leadership is not one of them. I think it's something that's really helpful. Um, and really can speak to things like communication style um, and teamwork. If you're a leader, you're often, especially if you're a good leader, you're usually a good team member. And so that speaks to kind of your teamwork ability. Um, we don't look or, or you know, score, evaluate specifically leadership, um, but we take into account if someone's been a leader, um, like if they've been in the military or if they've been a leader in a company, um, that often speaks to their teamwork and their communication, which is important to us. We had a question to come in, kind of um, piggyback with that one. Um, can you still be accepted without experience in a clinical setting? For example, a very high GPA, but zero medical experience with shadowing hours. No, you got to have some clinical experience. I, I think I found uh, like throughout this journey that in PA, you need a lot. You know, uh, in terms of the application, like you know, you requires the patient care hours and also the shadowing. Your GPA has to be high, so you know it can be a struggle for a lot of uh, students. But it can be, especially I think what I have heard over the last couple of years, especially with COVID, is that the biggest challenge is the shadowing. Is getting shadowing experience is really, really hard. So we still are continuing to count virtual shadowing experience. Um, I know a lot of our applicants have shadowed, you know, the PAs that they work with outside of their normal work hours. We didn't used to accept that. We do now because we understand that it's gotten much more difficult to find shadowing hours. Um, I think the healthcare experience is critical. Um, I think, you know, being a PA is different than being a nurse or a doctor. It just is. And, and it's really important that people have some clinical experience to show us that they really understand that this is what they want to do. Because being a PA is... It's not a nurse who follows algorithms and follows orders, and it's not a doctor who does whatever they want, right? We're sort of in this middle of we we still we have to have critical thinking and autonomy, um, but we also have to fit within a teamwork. And so it's a really unique uh, profession. And there's you know with that comes a, a lot of flexibility and a lot of autonomy within the team, and and it's a really amazing profession. Um, but I think it's really critical that you that applicants have experience to bring in with them so that they really understand what they're getting into. And it seems, and I found working with PAs that whatever their their patient care experience was before going to PA school really colors how they are as a provider. And that's quite interesting, like how much that has really helped. Yeah. The, like the way that they provide care. Um, I agree. And I think the other thing about that is that, you know, PA school is short there's not a ton of time to learn everything. You really have to build upon the stuff that you already have learned. So if you've been a medical assistant, you've been a nurse assistant, you've been an EMT or a paramedic, that experience is huge. And it's going to help you through PA school because PA school, and I know that this is like the analogy that everyone talks about, right? Trying to sip a sip of water through a fire hose. It, it's, we say that so often because it's true. It really does feel like that. And so when you have experience to build on, um, it makes you more successful. If you have nothing, you're just going to drown. 
We had another question come in. Um, is it okay to shadow a DO or NP instead of a PA? It is. I think, um, especially for people that have worked with PAs, um, it, it's helpful to shadow a, a doc or uh, an NP in another specialty. Um, I think I would caution people if they have not worked with PAs, I, I would say you need to shadow a PA. There needs to be something in your application that shows us you understand directly what a PA does. Um, so I think that when we've kind of let people get away with shadowing other healthcare providers, it's because they have experience working with PAs. They have a strong letter from a PA, um, not like their best friend or someone they know, but like someone that they've actually worked with. Because we see a lot of that, like, oh, my best friend went to PA school and they love it. And it's like, that's great. But I need to see a little bit more than that. I need to see that you really understand. You know, you've been in the clinic and, and know what's going on. Yeah, but you also have to understand what a scope of PA is and how they interact with the team. Absolutely. So, and those are really important, too. It's not like a, you know, I mean, kind of like saying I watch Grey's Anatomy and I could do right. brain surgery. You know, it's like it's not Right. Happen. Yeah, not quite the same. <laughs> yeah, again, yeah. I think as, a, as an applying student, keeping in mind that you are an investment for the school, and they want to make sure that, oh, well, this person, you know, is, is aware of, of what this entails. It's going to be investment that's, it's going to be worthwhile. They're going to go out and help a lot of people. It's called informed decision. Exactly. So we have, uh, there, speaking of the clinical rotations, uh, the question was asked if they're typically around campus, but I thought this might be a good opportunity. If any information that you'd like to give on the clinical rotations, uh, Samuel Merrick. Yeah, we have a lot of rotations around the campus area and around the, the Bay Area, um, just because of where we're located and, and our alumni network. Um, but we do consider local rotations to be within 100 miles. So that can include up into kind of the Sacramento area, Livermore, um, San Jose, South Bay. So it's a pretty big circumference around the university, what we consider to be local Bay Area rotations. Um, we do have rotations in Southern California. We have some in other places like Michigan, Southern Oregon, um, because of previous students or alumni that work in those areas and take students as, um, as on rotations. We have some in Northern California, like the Shasta of North Northern California area. Um, so we have them kind of all over the place. Um, for students that are coming from outside the Bay Area, or even for students who are coming from within the Bay Area, if they have rotations, like they've worked somewhere and they want to do a rotation there, um, we're certainly encouraging students to do that. Um, and, if, and there's a form and a kind of a process for how that works um, once they're in the program. Um, if students want to do rotations outside of the Bay Area, um, we can help set them up with the rotations we have, but we don't do new recruitment um, for outside of the Bay Area just because if you're like, oh, I'm from, I don't know, Colorado, and I want to do all my rotations back there. That's great, but we don't have the resources to find you nine rotations in Colorado. So we might have one or two that we already have used in the past and that we can call on, but we're going to need you to do a little bit of legwork to bring us some rotations from that community. Um, we're open to that for sure. We just don't have the resources to do full on recruitment for, you know, a whole new set of rotations. Our next question, um, Jeff wants to know, in addition to an undergraduate degree in biology, just for example, what type of typical additional prerequisites or prerequisite courses are desired from SMU or maybe other PA schools in general? Each PA school has a different recommendations or prerequisites. So some require stats. I think we still require stats. Um, they're all on. A, they're all listed on our website. Um, I'm. That's because that's not my job. I don't remember all of the specific prereqs that we have. That's Tonat's gig. Um, so if there are, they should all be listed, like how many units of all of our prerequisites are required. I think we require statistics. Some programs don't. Um, some programs require more or less microbiology or biochemistry, and some require less. So every program has a different set of prereqs. Um, you know, generally everyone requires like organic chemistry and biology and some amount of but the units might be different. I don't know. Sorry. I'm not good at that kind of stuff because I don't do that. I don't do the initial screenings, but they're all listed on the website. Um, generally, if you have a science degree, you're going to get most of the prereqs in your undergrad. Um, it's a lot of times people that go back and have to take a, a big chunk of their prerequisites after undergrad are because they didn't know they wanted a PA and they be a PA and they got like a lit degree or a history degree or, you know, something else and, and now help have to go back or if they didn't do very well in their prereqs and they want to retake them for a better grade 
Um, we sometimes see students, you know, retake anatomy or physiology um, after undergrad because they wanted to get a better grade. Um, but there, I think, you know, if you have a science degree, most of the prereqs are probably going to be met. And Samuel Merritt's um, website is very user friendly when it comes very to extensive. That. It, well, it's like this one, This it's very easy to follow. So it's, it's that's like, good. Um, so uh, you mentioned before about the holistic approach to admissions. Uh, there is an attendee asking about the value and upward trend of GPA, uh, but maybe a, just learning about what it means to be, you know, a holistic admissions process would be helpful. In answering that. Yeah. So the traditional admissions process is they look at GPA, GRE, you know, standardized kind of test uh, metrics and healthcare experience. Um, we look at those things, but we also look at your life experience. We look at teamwork and communication. Um, we look at uh, life experience as far as we're looking for a more well-rounded cohort of students. So we like students that um, have maybe been out of undergrad for a while and been working and doing interesting things, have a lot more community service, have been um, serving in the military, have experience you know, working as a paramedic or whatever. Um, lots of our applicants have done AmeriCorps or Peace Corps. Um, we have people that speak, you know, multiple languages. So we're, we're kind of looking at all of that different experience and not just at GPA and healthcare experience. And um, that's what we mean by holistic admissions is we look at multiple different metrics. Um, as far as the GPA, we do look at upward trend of GPA. So we um, evaluate and give a score for the undergrad GPA as well as for the last 60 GPA units um, and look at, um, and that's kind of how we um, put applicants into different tracks as to what's their undergrad GPA. And then if it's if it's in a lower bracket, um, if their last 60 has trended upward, um, then they're going to kind of move through the process um, and get evaluated more deeply. We have a multi-step process for how we do admissions, and that's part of the holistic process is kind of that initial evaluation of do they meet the minimum GPA? Do they meet the minimum? Do they get all their prereqs? Is their degree verified? Um, kind of those basic stuff. And then it moves on to the next track. And then we look at how did the GPA trend and what other experiences that they had in their life. And then it moves on to the next track and it gets much more deeply evaluated by individual faculty members. So it's a long <laughs> involved process. Um, and we really are trying to get to know you and get to know if you'll be a good fit for, for the profession and for the program. We had a we had another question that asked, is it okay to retake classes at a community college instead of a university? It is. And for a lot of people, um, it's difficult to get prereqs at a four-year university. So a lot of people will take them um, at an undergrad, uh, like a JC or a community college, and that's fine. I have my own question. So in your introduction, I noticed that you spent quite a long time um, in a Spanish, Spanish immersion program, working at the Board of Mexico. Uh, and obviously, it's really important in California. Uh, Spanish yes. public speaking. I was just talking to Job the other day. It's like getting pulled very, very frequently to help translate. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of being a university in California, how does that factor into you know what you're what you're looking for in students, or what what students can do to you know better fit the demographic that we have here in our state. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things about the Bay Area is it's not, it's certainly a Spanish, but it's not just Spanish, right? We have a huge population that speaks, you know, various Asian dialects, and we have a lot of people from the Middle East that are speaking, um, you know, different languages. We have a lot of, of Afghani refugees, and we have a lot of people from all over the world in the Bay Area. And so I think any second or third language is incredibly helpful, Um when you're going out and doing clinical rotations, we have several clinics that will only take students who speak Spanish. Um, we have a couple like Asian health community um, where you need to speak Chinese or Vietnamese in order to do rotations at those community clinics. Um, and we always have students that fit those, you know, fit those criteria. And so it's never been an issue. We always are able to find the students that can rotate in those clinics. Um, but there is such a huge need, particularly for Spanish, just because of where we're located geographically, right? But um, but also for a lot of the Asian dialects as well, um, and more and more for the Middle Eastern dialects. Um, 
So we're not looking in the application process for specific languages, but um, when people are able to speak multiple languages, um, that typically indicates that they've had other kind of interesting life and community experiences um, that they can bring with them. Um, and it's also going to be really helpful when they work out in the community. At the university, we don't currently have any language courses. We used to have a medical Spanish course, um, but the instructor that taught that course moved on. Um, he was from Cuba and he taught that course for several years. Um, and we don't have that anymore. We partner with Canopy Spanish um, program, which is a language program. So students have access to do the full Canopy Spanish language program um, as a student for free, which I think is a 16 week program. They get a certificate at the end of it. And the students have said that's really helpful in getting them up to speed in just basic Spanish um, before they go out on rotations. Um, but that's one of the things that we're kind of looking at is you know, as we move into a new building and have more inter, um, interprofessional education opportunities and more programs on campus is doing things like, you know, ethics courses that are more interprofessional or language courses that, you know, not just Spanish, but other language courses that um, that will help students out in the community. That's great. I had a question come up about how do the interviews work at SMU or when do the interviews start? The interviews are all day. They're really long. Um, they start that is a kind of a transition this last year we started we did a one early interview day in october um and we loved it it was amazing and so we're hoping to do um one or two early interview days this fall maybe one in september one in october um we've never done that before our interviews have always been in january and february um which is late and so we did an early interview day in October and then a couple in January and it was fantastic. And so um, we're hoping to do, it's not solidified yet, but we're hoping to do an early interview day in the fall, um, at least one, and then do another two probably in January. Um, how do interview days work? They are all day long. Um, we run you through lots of different super fun activities. So you get to do um, a panel interview with me as the program director. Um, students are put, applicants are put into groups of about six or eight students, um, and they kind of move through the day in that group. Um, and then they, so they do a group interview with me, they do a group interview with students, kind of a student panel uh, interview, and then they do um, some other group activities. We usually have a campus tour if the campus is open. Um, and uh, some other kind of group activities. And then they have individual interviews with faculty. So they have two interviews with faculty, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, two different faculty. And lunch, and I'm probably forgetting something, but it's a long day of getting to know each other. Yeah, just sounds like a long day. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, unfortunately, this is gonna be our last question. Thank you so much. You ran through so many questions. It was such a pleasure to have you here. And it was a lot of really wonderful information. Last question, I think, uh, let's see, what character traits would you consider to be key to becoming a great PA? What matters most to you in all of your experience seeing PAs graduate, being a PA? That's maybe the most important question that someone has asked. That's a really important question. Um, and this is what we talk about at interviews. And what we're looking for at interviews, because everyone that we interview is qualified, right? Every single person that gets to an interview. This last year, we had 1,736 applications. We, in the department, evaluated about 1,100 of those. We had about 300 priority, best of the best, amazing people that we wanted to interview. And we ended up interviewing about 145 people for 44 spots. So that's a huge break right, coming down to 44 spots. Um, and so when we interview those hundred and wow, that tickles. Thank you, Kat. Um, when we interview those 144 people, what are we looking for? We're really looking for, are you, are you going to fit, right? Do you fit our mission and values? And are you going to fit in in our program um, and go out there and be a PA that works in the community and helps, you know, make the world a better place, right? And so that's really what we're looking for is to go from 1,700 to people, 1,700 people to 144 people. Um, what we're really looking for is, is who are you and are you going to fit? And so that question is maybe the most important one. Um, and I think the qualities that make you a good student and a good PA are communication. We want people that have good communication style, good communication, um, like open, non-judgmental, uh, uh, ability to develop rapport with people, um, you know, easy communication style 
people that are good team members, because as a PA, you have to be able to be a good team member. So you have to be um, able to work well with other people. You have to be open. You have to be willing to accept your mistakes. You have to be you know, willing to learn from your mistakes. Um, that to me is what makes a good team member. You have to be resilient and flexible. And that's so important. Things in medicine change all the time. Um, and that's true in the world and in other professions, but that's especially true in medicine. It changes so fast all the time and you have to be able to roll with that. And we say in our department all the time that PAs do more with less and you just, you have to be okay with that. You can't be rigid in your box and say like, well, this is the way I learned it. And this is the way it is. It changes all the time. You have to be able to think creatively, think critically, um, and be resilient and be able to, to roll with whatever, with whatever happens and whatever changes happen. And I think that that's what we're looking for when we look at, at application or not applications, but in the interview process is, you know, do you have a good communication style? Are you going to work well with others and be a good team member? Um, are you going to have that flexibility and resilience um, forever throughout the, you know, throughout your, your profession and your continuing education experience, because that's really what's required for longevity and success in this profession. That's kind of a long answer, but that's, no, that's, that's my answer. That's perfect. I'm, I'm glad we closed on that one. And again, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your session. Thank you.